unless it's acted on by an external force. Until it's acted on by an external force. And so that's, that's saying that something, last week I had the basketball, and I laid it on the ground, and I said this basketball will stay at rest forever until it's acted on by an outside or external force, kicked it and the ball moves because it's acted on by an external force. The same way the ball will continue to move forever and ever until acted on by an external force. And we went and we, and we were discovering what it meant for us and how inertia relates to us and how we all have these external forces in our lives. We all have these things that influence us. We all have these things that affect us. We all have these things that are kind of like we wish wouldn't be a part of our lives, but they're influencing us. And then we went into this idea that, that, that external forces have influence over us when, when we place two things on them. Or we could put it as an external de- force is defined by something that we give attention to and something that we have expectations of. So attention. So the things that we give attention to are often the things that influence us. The things that we're focusing on are the things that affect us. The things that we are aware of are the things that influence us. The things that we think about are the things that influence our day-to-day life. If you want to throw that uh, video up, It's similar to the one last week, but different. See if you can catch it. Cool, thank you. That's a just, who, who caught the things that changed? Oh, some of you who've already seen the episode, probably. It's this idea, the attention is this idea, he said it in there, it's impossible for us to focus on more than one thing at a time. So it's very important, it's very imperative on what we're focusing on. And as human beings, it's very natural for us to focus on negative things. It's very natural for us to focus on things that, that actually hurt us rather than help us. So we talked about that attention. What's our attention on? And then we talked about expectation. What are we expecting from other people that we shouldn't be expecting of? Are we expecting to find our happiness in in, in a relationship? Are we expecting to find our happiness in a friendship? Are we expecting to find our happiness in a job? Are we expecting to find our happiness in things in this world? Because the attention and the expectation multiplied together produce the influence that that thing or that person will have over our life. If you remember, I had a whiteboard up last week and I drew the graph. I wanna, I'm going to put some, some graphs up here um, that, that we talked about just to, just to go over it again. So our expectation times 
our attention equals its influence. So if we put our, if we have like a, a level of five, which is like a, a good amount of attention on something, but we don't really expect anything of it, this would be um, maybe a video game, or this maybe uh, maybe um, social media, Facebook, Instagram, where we're putting a good amount of attention in it, but it really we don't really expect anything out of it. We're putting a lot of attention in it, but it's really just mindless attention. And so the influence that that thing has in our life is actually very minimal. If you go to the next one, you could have it where you're expecting something or you're expecting a lot out of someone or something, but we're actually not giving that thing very much attention. That could be a relationship. It could be from our family. We expect our family to, to be there for us. We expect our family to love us. We expect our family to do all these things for us, but we actually don't actually give them that much attention. And so the influence that they have over our lives is, is like a 21, it's very minimal. It's just right on the bottom. And then you have the next, the next option or the next, where we have the attention and the expectation are both fairly high. And for a lot of young people, this is relationships. For a lot of young people, it's their friendships where they're putting all this attention into someone else, into somebody. They're putting all their expectation to find their happiness in someone. And then that person fails them and then it totally destroys us and, and, and shapes the way that we see the world. Because if we have a lot of attention plus a lot of expectation, we get heavy influence in our life. Then we have the next the next option, which is we give a lot of attention to something, but we don't actually expect anything from it. This could be video games for some of us gentlemen in here. I'm trying to find who my video gamers are. <laughs> They're looking angrily, angry at me. This could be for women. I don't really know. What could this be for women? <laughs> I'm not a woman, so I don't know. There's a book out there, it says, it says, what men know about women, and it's a book, and it's like 400 pages long, every, every page is blank. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's really true. Our next graph. We don't have another one. That's okay. I was getting annoyed at them anyways. So last week, if you remember, we reflected a lot. We were, thinking, we were talking about, we were asking ourselves the what. What are we giving our attention to? What are we expecting of, of someone else? What, what, what? What are the things? And then we talked about seeking first. And what, do we, what does it look like for us to seek first the kingdom of God? And tonight what I want to do is I want to move from the what and I want to move to the why. I want to move to the why are the things taking our attention. I want to move to why we are expecting so much because what I've found out is that if we only change what we're doing, we'll always have the same outcome if we don't really get to the why. You can relate it to a tree, to a plant. If a tree is producing the, uh, rotten fruit, it's not the fruit's fault. It's, 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 the, it's, the, it's the root structure, it's the foundation of the tree or the plant that is actually hurting and broken and dying. It's the root. So instead of accusing and instead of changing what's on the tree and changing just the fruit, we need to get to the root. We need to get to the foundation of what is actually happening in our lives. Instead of just saying, I'm, putting, I'm thinking about this and I'm thinking about this and I'm, and I'm putting my attention on this and I'm expecting this of someone, so maybe I should just put my attention on something else or maybe I should just expect less or maybe I should... So instead of changing the what... Let's try to figure out the why. Because that's where the place of healing is. That's where the place of freedom is. That's where the place of, of change for the kingdom of God, sustained change, actually takes place. But unfortunately, we have a, a structural system in, in America and even across the world where it's called public schools and and we never actually teach kids why, we only teach them what. And it worked out, I, mean, I, was, I was, I'm pretty good at memorizing, forgetting, so, you know, it worked out for me, I got good grades, I did it, but I never understood why, I never asked why, all I ever did was just do what they told me to do. 
And so we have this structural system where they tell you, you need to know this, 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 and this, and this, and this. And this is going to be our test. I literally had classes in college where they said, these are the test questions. Has anyone else had a class like that? These are going to be on the test. Study these, but why? It doesn't matter why. So we have a group of people, we have a group of, of individuals who, who going to the why is very foreign to them. But unless we go there, we'll never actually build a strong foundation in which to build our relationship with God and our life upon. Because someday something will happen to us in which our foundation will be shaken and we would have never asked the question why. So we ask the question why when we're in a state of emotional turbulence. So it's important that we ask these questions now, in a safe place, in a place where we can reason logically and, and, and spiritually, and we can, we can fight through these things and God can speak into them. Because here's, rea- here's the reality. We, we strongly believe here at Access that hurt people hurt people. The only reason why people do the things they do to hurt people is because they're really hurting inside. The only reason why we act out in anger and frustration, the only reason why we're prideful, the only reason why we degrade people and talk down to them and about them is because we're really hurting inside and we're we're hiding our insecurities by projecting that on someone else. But we also strongly, strongly believe that free people, free people. We strongly believe that we're when someone is living in freedom, they have the ability through Holy Spirit to actually to carry freedom wherever they go. And it's so attractive and it actually makes some people so angry because they don't know what it's like to walk in freedom. But we believe that going to the why is, puts us in a position where God can deliver freedom to us where Holy Spirit can actually work through the things that we don't even know are going on inside of us and he can actually free us from the hurts and the pains and the confusion that we have through our life experiences. Because Jesus came, he says he came to set the captives free. He came to set us free. I can tell you guys what to think. I can, tell you right, I can tell you right now what to think. And I'll say, it'll change your whole life because it's in the Bible. It's going to change your whole life if you just think about these things. All the time, just think about these things. Don't think about anything else. Take your attention off the other stuff. Put your attention on these things. And if you put them on these things, then everything will change. And that's true. But me telling you what to think is not as powerful as me and, and us leading you in a position to where we can show you how to think and why, we're, why to think that way. Because we believe there's freedom in that. So Philippians 4.8, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. So last week we talked about what's your attention on. And it would be very easy for me just to say, just think, just leave it up. Just think about all these things. Just don't think about the other stuff. Don't don't think about the emotional stuff that you've been through. Don't think about your past and the hurts and the pains. Just forget about all that stuff. Just forget about it. Just forget about and think about these things, and your whole life will just be grain and dandy. The problem is we never actually get to the root of why you thought the original thought in the first place. And if we don't deal with that root, it it will be carried with you forever. And you won't even know it. If we don't deal with these things, if we don't position ourselves in in vulnerability and honesty before God, we'll always live through our past hurts, our past pains, our past regrets, our past experiences. Jesus wants to set us free from all those things. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get vulnerable with, with all of you guys. I I went through. I've been through. We all been through this stuff. And for me, going through high school, going even actually going through junior high and high school, I, I had a problem with 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 lust and, and pornography. 
And I would go through, and I would go through these times, and I'm not, it breaks my heart because I was just so confused. And I would go through these times to where I would, I, I, I would, I would be doing good, and then you mess up, and then you're doing good, and you mess up, and you feel bad, then you feel bad, then you feel bad. You say, I'm never going to do it again. I'm never going to do it again. I'm going to think about these things. I'm going to think about the things that are pure and lovely, and pure and lovely, and pure and lovely. But then something happens where your guard's down, and all of a sudden you hit, hit again, and you get discouraged, and, you, and it continues all over again. And then you go a month, and then you go two months, and then you go three months. And then it continues to hit, hit, hit. And I say, but I'm trying to think about all the right things but until one moment, until God dealt with me about the why. Because I was just trying to change the fruit and he, was, he wanted to get down into my very being, into my belief system, and he had to change that belief system in me. So many times we just want to do the right thing. We just want to be good Christians and do right things and, so that we can look good to the world. And God's saying, I didn't, I didn't create you to just do good things. I created you to be, be made and created in my image. So what changed? God took me to a place in my own quiet time, my own prayer life, and my own hurt and pain. And he took me to a place in my own brokenness, where I, I sat in my room, I sat in my place of study, and, I, and I, I said, God, what the heck? God, I don't want this. This is, de literally, it's death in me. I don't want to do it. And he took me to a place where, where I, I had to, he had to show me where, where, I, was, where was, I was off, where my belief system was off. Because I was believing something about, and what he brought me to is he says, you're believing something incorrectly about sex. You believe something about sex that is incorrect or that is unparalleled with my nature. And if you do not understand the purpose of sex, you will always misuse it. If we don't understand the purpose of why God created something, we will always, always, always misuse it. So what did he have to teach me? He brought me to a place where, he, where, where through the Bible and, 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 and through just prayer and, and really thought and meditation, he brought me to a place where sex was not about pleasure. He took me to Genesis 1. Sex was not about pleasure. It was never created for pleasure. Pleasure is a byproduct, but sex was never made for pleasure. It was not designed To give us a fix. It was not designed to feel good. He brought me to Genesis 1. It says, the man and the woman, he created them to become one. And in a moment, and I can't tell you this, this is something that we have to figure out on our own. And, and I know for most this is mostly talking to guys. This is mostly relating to guys. But for women, it's important for us to understand this too, that sex is always meant for unity in, in the confounds of marriage. It was only meant for Adam and Eve, for married couples to come together and become one in spirit, soul, and body. And when he taught me that, it changed everything about the way I thought about sex. And when I realized the problem that I was having was rooted in the fact that, that I had actually thought that sex was made for pleasure. And so he dealt with that, and then it dealt with that. So instead of just going here and saying, I need to think about the right things, think about the right things. Now, there is discipline. I'm not saying there's no discipline. But I'm saying is... Let's get to the root cause, let's fix the root belief system, the, the, the lie that we're believing, and then let's practice discipline. Because our, then our discipline will be motivated by truth, and the truth will set us free. Because <laughs> if we only just fix the what, there will be other what's that will just come along. That's right. Drop the mic. But before we start getting into the why, it's important we understand the way in which we approach the why. 
So there's going to be a posture that our, that, our, that our mind and our heart and our being is going to approach God when we ask these questions. And it's important that we approach in the correct posture. I thought of it in a way of, there have been some nasty seeds that have been placed inside of us from the time that we were growing up from the time that we watched TV, from the time that we, watched, we saw our parents and how they did things and it was just wrong. So we, we have all these ideas and concepts of how the world works and all these nasty seeds get placed. And then through time and through experience, these, these actually, I would call them weeds, they grow up into weeds and they start growing inside of us. And the way that we need to approach the why is getting to the root of that, plucking out that seed or that root system and replacing it with the truth a seed of truth. And we're going to go through a, a passage in Romans 12 that is just amazing. And then afterwards, we're going to go into a time of, of, of worship that I believe that there's going to be literal freedom that's going to come to a, a lot of people here tonight. Freedom as we approach God, as we approach him in the correct posture. So here we go. Let's get going into Romans 1. Or Romans 12 one, sorry. I'm going to read it first and then I'm going to break it down into sections and show us how we're going to approach God and how, how this describes and how to approach God. Romans 12 one. Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. So the first part, if you can just leave that up for the, for the entire time that I'm talking about it, that will help. Thank you. The first part, it says, it says brethren, by the mercies of of God, as we approach Him and as we think about the things that are going on, the external forces, that we, as, as we think about the things that have influence over our lives, we first, before we even deal with those things, we have to approach God's throne in the context, in the viewpoint of His mercy. In that His mercy is so grand that we deserve death, we deserve to be cast into hell, we, just, we, didn't, we don't deserve anything, but by God's, God's mercy, He pours out His love on us, and He says, don't ever lose sight of that mercy. In view of God's mercies, always keep your eyes on mercies and that we were sinners, but God saved us because He loved us. He saved us because He wanted us. He saved us because He saw something in us that was so valuable. Don't ever lose sight of my mercy for you. It says, it says in Proverbs to bind it around your neck, to tie mercy around your neck. Never forget about it. In 1 Corinthians 2, Paul's talking and he says, I refuse to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. And I believe there's two reasons why he, he made that statement. The first reason is because in the cross, in Jesus dying for us, he proves our value. Through the cross, Jesus proved that we were valuable enough to God for him to send his son, the perfect sacrifice for us. The second reason why he, we, were, we should refuse to know nothing is because it reminds us of God's mercy. His mercies are new every day. We've been forgiven so much. Always approach him in a sense of, God, you've forgiven me. You've forgiven me. Help me to receive that forgiveness. Second part, it says, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. And when it says this word bodies, it's actually not referring to our physical body, it's referring to our whole being. So we have this thing where we come before God with mercy, saying, thank you for forgiving us, thank you for loving us, thank you for pouring out mercy every day. And then after we do that, we present our bodies. We present it before him, vulnerable, we present it before him. It says as a living sacrifice. In the Old Testament, they would sacrifice 
animals for the forgiveness of sins. They had to have their sins forgiven so they would take a lamb into the temple or into the tabernacle in the holy place and they would, they would sacrifice, they would slit the throat of the animal and the blood was for the forgiveness of sins. So we have this picture of us presenting our bodies before God as a living sacrifice where everything is laid bare. He says, first find mercy and then present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Anything is available, God, for you to take and surgically remove through Holy Spirit. Everything is available. Nothing is off limits. Nothing is off limits for you, God. And this is the place where we're so afraid of because we're so afraid of, of stepping into the light. We're so afraid of being exposed for who we truly are. Nick and I were talking in the office and he went to go see Ravi Zacharias, if you all know who he is, last week. And, and, and one of the guys who was speaking with him, he said, can you imagine, did he have an accent? Yeah, he had an accent. He said, can you imagine if... if your thoughts from the last 24 hours were played on a screen for everyone to see. <sighs> you see, we know ourselves, but this is, God says, I, he's, you're not fooling me. We're not fooling him, guys. So he's saying, since we can't fool him, he says it's better to present ourselves than to hide away from him because he knocks at the door, but he never barges his way in. And the reason why it's so hard for us to present our bodies to him, all the things that we don't like about ourselves, all the things that we know are wrong, all the things that we're believing, that's why we won't ask why, 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 why am I doing these things, why? Why? Why is this person, why is this situation holding me down? Why are, they, or why are they influencing me so much? Because we're afraid that in this position of vulnerability that God will take advantage of us. We're afraid that, it, we're afraid that if we present our bodies to him, he's going to reject us. Because he sees our flaws, he sees all the things that are wrong with us. But if we keep reading, it says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Oh, it says, holy sacrifice acceptable to God. Our biggest fear of being rejected before God is just rebuttaled right here when it says acceptable to God. That means when we come and approach him and we say, God, God, here I am. He says, I will accept you for who you are. We're not fooling him. In Psalm 139, it talks about, it's King David and he's saying, God, search me and know me. Search everything in me, God, and know me. And if there's anything that is, that is incorrect about my heart, God, expose it for what it is so that you can remove it and plant a seed of truth inside of me. We feel that we're going to be rejected. All the while, God's saying, listen, the more, the more that you do that, the more that I'm going to accept you. And then the last part. It says, this is, or which is, your spiritual service of worship. There's a physical act of worship. The physical act of worship is when we come together as a corporate body and we raise our hands and we sing to God. But God is saying something here. He's saying, your spiritual act of worship, remember the spiritual is unseen. What is seen is temporary. What is unseen is spiritual and is eternal. So what he's saying here is this is your spiritual act of worship that when, you, when we stand before God, we present our bodies a living sacrificing. Nothing's off limits, God. Nothing is off limits from you speaking truth into it. And we present our bodies and say, God, why am I doing those things? Why am I believing those things? God, I'm sick and tired of falling back into sin, back into sin, back into sin. I don't want to deal with the fruit. I want to deal with the root. So God, please deal with the root. And he says, this is your spiritual act of worship. This is worship before God, guys, when we present ourselves vulnerable for, to him so that he can speak into us. This is worship. This is worship when we, when we say to God, nothing is off limits to you. Nothing is off limits And the most beautiful thing, 
Romans 12, 2. It's one of my favorite verses. It's the verse right after what I'm talking about. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So this position that we're in, a vulnerability, where God, we're asking the why. We're asking, why am I doing this? And we expose it, and God actually reveals the lie that we're believing. He says, this is your spiritual act of worship. And in this position is where your, your mind will actually be renewed. It's not through just thinking, repeating new thoughts. It's no, it's in the position of vulnerability where God speaks and replaces your old thoughts with a seed of truth, new thought. For me, I took that verse and I was always like, okay, I'm just going to train my mind. I'm just going to think, 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 think. So that I can have a renewed mind. No, God is saying, no, 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 no. It's in the position of worship that your mind is renewed. It's in the position where you say, God, I don't have it all figured out. God, there's areas in my life that I don't even know are there. Expose them in me so that I can be free, so that I can help free other people. Because that's what our mandate is. That's what our call is. So as we identify, as we point out what the external forces are in our lives, what the things we're placing our attention on, what the things that we're expecting from, Let's ask the why. Let's go into a time where we can really reflect and say, God, why am I doing these things? And God, please please bring freedom. Please help me, God. I lay them bare before you. If we would do this as a body, this is not a one-time thing. This is a daily thing. This is a daily thing that we say, God, if there's anything inside of me, please expose it for what it is and replace it with the truth of what your word says. A daily life of worship. Daily life of worship. So as we go into our time of worship here, the band can come up. Oh no, the band's gone. I'll sing to you guys. <laughs> You're a good, good father. It's who you are. <laughs> <laughs> Tiffany, you need me to sing? Ricky, is your voice gone? I'll sing for you if you want. So as he asks the question, what has my attention? Let's ask the question, why does it have my attention? As we ask the question, what is the thing or what are the things that are most influencing me? Let's ask the question, why are they influencing me? God brought me back, as, as I go back to the, the whole idea with the, with the lust and, and the pornography and the sex, the purpose of sex that God taught me. As I was going through that, he brought me back to a place to where I was 10 years old. And I was in with, my, with one of my friends from school, from a Christian school. And he took out a magazine. And he said, look at this, look at this, Jake. God brought me back to that point, and he said, Jake, you have to deal with that. You have to deal with that because that's where it all began. And that's coupled with the purpose, but it's also the point where it started, and I have to repent from that, and I have to say, God, I'm sorry, even though I didn't know any better. I'm sorry, God, and I repent from that. He wants to bring us back to the point of origin that is causing the pain that we're living in and and the hurt and and, and the lies that we're believing. He wants to bring us back to the origin. So what are those influences in your life, in our lives? Let's ask why. Let's present our bodies. And remember, always focusing first on mercy that we are always forgiven. And after we realize that we're always and we're, we're already forgiven, we can present our bodies a living sacrifice to God. And then he says, as we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, he says, then he will accept us. And he says, this is your worship. This is your spiritual worship. So as we go into a time of worship, I, I encourage all of us to go through this and to think about and to wrestle with the Why? 
And then what I truly believe is that Holy Spirit is going to start exposing things in us that we never knew were actually in there. And that he, his Spirit's actually going to reveal truth through the words that are sung and through the words that are spoken and through Holy Spirit who reveals the truth to us. Because he's a much better teacher than I am. Will you just bow your heads and pray with me? You can stand if you want as we go into this time. God, we want to be known as worshipers. Those who worship in spirit and in truth. So God, Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are going to show us, bring us back to moments of hurt and pain so that you can effectively comfort us, God. You're the comforter. So I pray that everyone here, I pray that all of us would have a spirit and would have a moment of honesty with ourselves and a moment of vulnerability where we can present ourselves to you, God. And you said that if we come to you, God, you will, you will shower us with mercy and love and forgiveness. God, I thank you that freedom is found tonight. God, that there's people here who have never known freedom. There's people here who have never even experienced it. But tonight is going to be a defining moment in which they find freedom. And that freedom is not a situation. That freedom is a person. Freedom is, is, is gazing upon Jesus Christ. So I pray, God, that tonight... In our weaknesses, and our hurts and pains, God, you are going to be the greatest comforter ever tonight, God. And that we would actually be able to worship you more authentically and genuinely than we've ever done before because we were laying nothing bare, nothing's hidden, nothing is off limits for you tonight, God. And in that moment, God, you're refining us and strengthening us to be the people that you've called us to be, people who are free, people who are on fire, who know they are who they are, who have a foundation built on truth and a foundation built on love and mercy from, the, from you, God. I thank you, God, that you are the greatest teacher, so continue to teach us what it means to know you. Teach us what it means to be a son, to be a daughter, to be a child tonight.